All right. Hello. Um, I've not done this before. I've got the uh, screen down here and the camera there and some notes here. And I'm pretty excited. A, a long list of uh, things that I'd like to talk about, um, but I'd love to hear what your questions are. And I will totally change my whole plan based on any comments you make. So if you have a question, I have the chat here up on the screen. Just type, type in your question and I will go through hopefully any and all of your questions, uh, whatever fits in this hour. Uh, maybe just a quick introduction to who I am. Um, my name is Natasha Jaffe. I am a cellist. Um, I come originally from, well, I grew up in the United States. I was born in Canada. Uh, my parents are both cellists and most of my family members and extended family members are also musicians of all different kinds. Um, I've been living in Berlin, Germany since 2012, uh, which was right after I finished my studies in the US. Um, and I've, uh, I've been teaching the cello, improvising on the cello. I play with different bands and singer-songwriters. I play with string quartets and orchestras and all sorts of things as a freelance cellist. And this past year, or actually in 2020, uh, I released my very first album of solo songs called Cello in Bloom. Um, these, they're not entirely solo, it's me with myself and several versions of myself uh, with cello ensemble music for anywhere between uh, four and five cellists, or three and five cellists. So if you want to check that out, uh, there will be, or there are links in the description to my album Cello in Bloom. You can also visit my website and uh, see more about what I do. Um, so as I said, I've been teaching for, for a while in Berlin since 2012. Um, actually, when I started teaching much earlier in various uh, different locations as a student. Um, and uh, one of the things I've realized after, well, especially recently, is that a lot of people are starting to feel comfortable buying a cello or renting a cello and at least getting some of the basics down on their own uh, online by watching YouTube videos and tutorials. Um, there are a lot of interesting tutorials, especially for beginners on YouTube. Many of them are quite good. Others are questionable. Um, so, uh, but one of the things that I feel is missing is, uh, is some answering of questions to basic cello care. What do you do uh, with your cello when you take it home? How do you care for it? How do you deal with it? What should you watch out for? Um, so that you're not actually running to the instrument maker every time or having to send emails to wherever you purchased your cello from. Um, by the way, I hope you can all hear me. If you have any trouble hearing me or if anything seems strange, then uh, just let me know in the comments and I will keep checking those to make sure I don't miss anything. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start with, you've got a cello. You've potentially ordered a cello online um, or you've gone to an instrument shop and uh, purchased a cello or rented a cello. Um, for beginners, I really, I'm going to throw this in there, I really recommend renting a cello first. You tend to get much better cello quality for a much smaller price. And then if you decide after a year or two, when you've really tried out the instrument that you don't want to play anymore, it's very easy to then just give the cello away. And you usually won't have spent much more than the 100 or 200 that you will, you would have given to Amazon or whatever for your incredibly cheap, badly set up Chinese instrument that you purchased for such a tiny price. Um, Salut l'élève de Jasmine, uh, c'est superbe de te voir. Sorry, that was from one of the comments. So I said earlier um, in the description for some of this that I might be able to switch languages. Uh, I do speak French and German, so some of the questions I will translate as necessary. All right, so where, I, where was I? So you've uh, hopefully rented a cello because cheap cellos are usually difficult to play or badly set up. And, uh, or you've purchased one. And so you're gonna take it home and the first thing you need to know is uh, where you're going to put it. Um, cellos are made out of wood. Uh, generally speaking, there are some carbon fiber cellos uh, I've even seen a metal cello. If your cello is made out of wood though, um, try to keep it away from windows, away from heaters, away from humidifiers, 
and uh, certainly outside out of the direct sunshine, not next to an air conditioner, you want to keep it basically somewhere where the temperature stays quite steady and where the humidity also stays steady. You don't want it to get dry and then warm and wet and all the different things. Uh, the wood absorbs the humidity and uh, also lets go of it, which means that it will warp if it experiences too many humidity and temperature changes in a short period of time. Uh, that doesn't mean your cello has to stay in a museum quality perfect box where everything stays the same. Um, it basically just means that you don't want fast changes. So you don't want your cello to go from really cold to really hot within five minutes. But if you can give it a half an hour or an hour to get used to cold and then warm um, in, a, in a kind of controlled environment, then you will have much better success in keeping your cello alive and well for a long time. Um, I guess one of the ways that you can reduce drastic temperature changes is to keep your instrument in a case or a bag, uh, whichever, whichever you have, until it has gotten used to the new temperature or the new humidity. And then generally speaking, avoid extreme temperatures. Try not to leave your cello in the very cold temperatures for too long. Um, some, certainly sub-zero freezing temperatures are, are not good for, for wooden instruments and uh, very hot temperatures are also eventually not, not so good for the wooden, temp wooden instruments either. Um, so that's basically the idea there. Always make a nice gentle change from one temperature to another. More or less anything that feels comfortable for you, your cello can handle just fine. Uh, right, so I talked about cello bags and cello cases. Most people who get a cello will end up getting a bag with their cello or a case with their cello, something to carry it with so that they can take it home. So depending on what you've got, um, you probably have a few different things you want to watch out for. Um, so choosing whether you want a cello bag or a cello case uh, is really a matter of personal preference. It will have a lot to do with how you live and what you do with your cello. If you rarely leave the house, um, you can probably be fine with a cello bag. It will usually stay in its bag at home anyway. Um, cello bags are light and they're really cheap. So for anyone who uh, doesn't have much of a budget or who has maybe some back problems or shoulder problems, which would make it difficult to carry a cello in a heavier case, um, cello bags can be really helpful. I also think that if you're traveling a lot by car, a cello bag might be just fine. Um, but I did read, uh, someone brought up the point that if you're if you are involved in a car accident, then obviously the cello bag will not help your cello survive the accident. But uh, I believe, generally speaking, um, as long as the cello is, is in a safe place in your car, it will probably do about as well as you, and uh, it should be should be just fine, even in a cello bag. You can try to keep it inside of the car rather than in the trunk, um, but either bag or case will work. Sometimes the bags are just easier to put inside and take out of the car, uh, especially for small cars and compact cars. Um, cello cases, uh, there are a few, few options for cello cases. There is what they call kind of a a hard shell case or foam, hard foam case. The hard foam cases are usually a relatively inexpensive um, variation of a case. They're not entirely an actual hard plastic or carbon fiber case. So they're not that strong, but they are a bit sturdier than a bag. So they're actually stiff, which uh, for people who are traveling a lot with public transportation, um, but who don't want to have a heavy case, uh, I find is a really, really good compromise uh, between the two. So it's not, they're not too expensive, uh, but they're also a little bit more stable. So they'll help protect your cello from some bumps. Uh, if someone's passing you with some bags or backpacks, then your cello will not immediately be hit. Um, it will keep anything from hitting your bridge uh, too hard and um, that sort of thing. Mostly bumps and scratches will be, will be prevented that way. Um, however, hard shell cases and hard foam cases are not really strong. So if you're going to be traveling with the case, um, 
if you needed to be able to survive a small drop or a tipping over or falling down of any kind, then the hard shell case is, or the hard foam case is not the option for you. Um, an actual hard, hard case provides usually the best protection. There are different kinds. A lot of them are made out of plastic or fiberglass. Uh, there are some very old in uh, wooden cases. Uh, cases are not usually made out of wood anymore. Um, and Hello, Constantine. Um, there are also carbon fiber cases. Uh, carbon fiber cases are the lightest and provide usually some of the best protection for the weight, but they are usually also the most expensive. And so if you get a fiberglass case or a plastic case, they will be a little bit less strong, a little bit less capable of dealing with um, drops and travel accidents and that sort of thing, but uh, they will be cheaper. Um, they will also be a lot heavier. So depending on, again, if you have shoulder problems or back problems, you might really want to consider getting a carbon fiber case, um, despite the fact that they're more expensive, just because it will provide really the best protection with the lightest weight. Um, hard cases are also really helpful for helping the humidity and the temperature changes to stay um, as minimal as possible or as slow as possible. Um, because the hard cases provide just a lot more material between the the old temperature and the new temperature. So you will have a lot more, um, a little bit of an easier time keeping the temperature constant or at least slow changes of temperature for your instrument. Uh, right, hard cases though are not perfect. Um, even carbon fiber cases I've seen uh, can can be broken. Um, there are not so many options when it comes to air travel that are really safe. Um, when it comes to traveling with planes, I would just try to avoid it altogether, in a sense, um, because the uh, having the cello as a luggage item can work for years. Um, my father is a professional soloist, and he, he was also traveling around the world for decades with his cello. Uh, primarily as a luggage item, um, but it just takes one time for the cello to get one drop that was just a bit too much, and then uh, and then it could get a crack or be destroyed completely. There are some uh, kind of horrifying videos of cellos that have been destroyed through a case um, through airline companies. So I would definitely avoid having your cello as a luggage item if you're going to travel with a plane. The option is that you can travel with the cello inside of the plane. Uh, but for this, you also need a quite slim cello case, uh, preferably still a hard case, um, because the cellos will be buckled into a seat uh, next to the window and, uh, and they will travel with you in the cabin. Uh, this is definitely the best way for your cello to travel with you uh, on a plane, because it firstly keeps it from uh, sub-zero temperatures that happen in the cargo hold. Uh, it also means that it's as safe as you are uh, during the entire plane ride, uh, as you have control over what steps you take, if it falls down, where you put it down, how you put it down, and all these things. Uh, baggage handlers are sometimes are not quite as careful with our instruments as we wish they would be, despite fragile stickers and other protections that we try to have. Um, there are definitely flight cases. Uh, flight cases can be a case that goes over your regular case or a, an actual case that's your only case but it's an actual flight case these um they tend to be much thicker and much bulkier usually a bit heavier um, they're not really meant for daily use uh, but these can be a much safer option for uh, putting your cello as a luggage item on a plane if you have no other option sometimes the planes are in fact too small uh, to have the cello inside the cabin, or they don't allow it, or you feel like it's okay to take the risk of putting the cello under the plane, because it is a much cheaper option than uh, purchasing essentially another ticket for your instrument. Uh, speaking of uh, instruments and damage, um, if you have purchased a cello, uh, do consider insuring it. Even if it's not a very expensive instrument, um, you might have invested a thousand or several thousand uh, dollars, euros, whatever, into your instrument. 
and it will be really helpful if it is insured by a music insurance company. Make sure to read all the details about how the insurance company deals with your instrument. Um, some details such as uh, your instrument may be left in a car, however it must not be visible, are things that people will tend to overlook. Um, so for example, if you are planning to leave your cello in your car sometimes for a few hours or while you go shopping, um, do be aware that most insurance companies will not cover any theft of the instrument if the car, if the cello was in a visible place in your car, if they could see it through the window. Um, which means that uh, for those sorts of parking uh, trips or if you go shopping and you just leave your car, uh, probably best to put it in the trunk, make sure it's covered so that it's not visible from the outside. Um, there are other details depending on which insurance you have, so be, sh be sure to read all of the details of your insurance before hoping and assuming that uh, something is covered and then having the nasty surprise of it not being covered. Uh, insurance is really good also for car accidents, any other problems, and for the random accidents that happen at rehearsal spaces or concert locations or at home uh, for very re various reasons. Uh, I just really recommend it, uh, even for a very expensive uh, cello insurance is, is usually affordable, um, or you can shop around and find, find a version that's affordable for you. Um, all right, so once your cello is at home, you might not want to be keeping it in its case all the time, because you want to see it. You've purchased a beautiful cello, or maybe seeing it helps you have the motivation to practice. Um, for that, there are cello stands. Cello stands are a little bit of a debatable topic with, within the cello community. Uh, cello is really the only, the only safe place for a cello is always in its case, um, because there no one will trip over it and have it break, and no cats will jump on it, and no children will play with it, and basically nothing will happen to it, more or less, when you're at home and it's in the case. So most people will recommend have your cello out while you're playing it, put it back in its case and in a safe place when you're not playing it. This is absolutely the safest way to deal with your instrument. However, it's not practical for everyone. Um, so having a cello stand is a nice way to either keep the cello around while you're not playing, um, or maybe having, a, having it there so that while you're practicing, you can just put it down for a few minutes, grab a glass of water and come back and the cello is still out and not back in its case where you have to take it back out again. Um, cello stands should always be really stable. I would really recommend buying an actual cello stand that was built for cellos. Um, some of them will be kind of larger contraptions that hold the cello in some way. Uh, others are just boxes where you can fit the cello inside. Um, that's really a personal preference based on what you what your budget is, where the cello stand is going to be, what they look like, how aesthetic you want it to look. Um, so choose choose whatever cello, cello stand works for you, but make sure it's stable, that it won't tip over. Try not to use a guitar stand and hope that it will work for your cello. They're not built for cellos. They tend to be too small because guitars are much thinner um, than the average full-size cello. And, uh, and so just be sure that you've fit, found something that will really hold your cello properly. Um, that often means that there needs to be a much higher back so that the cello is supported also in the back. Um, they can be really motivating and they look very nice. However, if your cello is going to be on the stand, not just when you practice, but also all day long and all night long, um, do be sure that you're actually cleaning it off very regularly. Um, the cellos, the varnish that they have on cellos, I'll just pull up my cello. Um, the varnish that you have on a cello is not the same as what you have on your furniture. So very important point, do not try to re-varnish your own instrument. I've heard of people trying to do this. There is no furniture varnish that is the same as what's on your instrument. Um, instrument varnish is really thin and very specially made. Each uh, violin maker or most reputable violin makers have their own secret recipe, um, which may or may not be secret, but certainly their own recipe. And it's always, um, an integral part of the way that the instrument sounds. Uh, thicker varnish will really inhibit the vibrations of the instrument. 
and the thinner varnish will allow these vibrations to to actually function the way that they should. So the varnish is an important um, part of the instrument. Uh, oh yeah, Marco Pidvini, thank you. That's the maker of my cello. Um, thank you for, for the congratulations on my <laughs> projects. Uh, I am hoping to make another album this year, actually. That is, that is the answer to that question. Um, and hopefully some other more, some other videos with the new music. Uh, I'm composing a couple of new pieces. It's been a bit tough with the pandemic as I'm spending a whole lot of time at home and without uh, traveling or seeing very many other musicians and friends. Um, however, I am working on some new compositions and hope to be able to release them over the course of this year. And uh, much more like my last album, uh, I really went out of my way to try to have some video for every song. Um, the only song that's missing a video right now, at least publicly, is Stars and Galaxies. Um, I will be releasing the live video of that uh, soon as well. Uh, I do have it already done and uh, finished, but uh, it will be coming soon. Um, yeah, so I will hopefully make some video material for all of the new songs as well, or most of them, because uh, I find it uh, really important nowadays to have audio and video material. It just engages um, everyone who's listening to the music in, in a different way. Uh, so thank you, Marco. That's Fantastic to hear. All right, I was talking about cleaning the cello. I'm sure Marco has even his own ways of uh, of dealing with this. But my my basic my basic uh, thing is to tell everybody to have a soft cloth for your cello. I think uh, cotton is usually just fine, um, and wipe it down regularly. Uh, ideally, pretty much. and uh, certainly if your cello is living on a stand and not inside of its case, then it will get dusty on a daily basis. So you should really try to clean it off every day. Um, and, uh, and a dry soft cloth is usually enough for if you do this regularly. Um, there is some rosin that will fall onto the body of the cello. Rosin is not so healthy for the varnish of your instrument. So you do want to keep that rosin off of the varnish at least long term. And um, this is a little bit more important in a sense, or it's not more important, but it's a little, it goes, the process goes a little faster if you live in a very warm climate um, because the rosin will melt. Uh, the rosin melts actually quite quickly. As soon as it's uh, feeling summery and warm wherever you are, then the rosin will slowly melt. Um, it's a process that happens uh, not really visibly, but it will definitely happen. So if you live in a warm climate, you know your house is warm, wherever your cello lives is warm, then wipe your cello down really often because the rosin will otherwise melt onto the varnish. And at that point, it's almost impossible to take it off. Powdery rosin will come off with a soft cloth pretty easily. Um, there are some liquid instrument cleaners. Uh, I've really rarely or never used any on, on any instrument I ever owned. Um, it was never really necessary wiping down your instrument regularly so that all of the dust and everything just is already gone means that you don't need a liquid instrument cleaner to wipe off grime that's been caked into your varnish. Um, personally, I would actually just suggest taking your instrument to an instrument maker if you feel that it needs to get cleaned more properly. They will often have polishes that are really quite gentle for the varnish. Um, and if you happen to know the person who who made your instrument, then then that's probably also the best best place to know what to do uh, with your varnish and with your instrument. Uh, but certainly wherever you've purchased your instrument should be a good place to ask um, which instrument cleaning materials they suggest, uh, what you might want to buy, and that sort of thing. But my basic advice is to get a nice soft cloth, keep it uh, clean, wash it regularly, and uh, and then just wipe your cello off. So let me demonstrate. This is actually my niece's t-shirt. She was a very, very small child, so it's starting to get a bit dirty here. Um, but basically wiping down your cello would mean that you'd go through most of the cello, get off of get off all the dust that you might see, making sure that you really check the spots here by the bridge, because these spots above the bridge, that's where the rosin will usually collect from your playing. You can also wipe down your bridge if you want. Um, the next thing that you want to do is to wipe off your strings. You should do this also quite regularly. The more regularly you do it, the easier it will be every time. Um, and then you can also clean 
uh, all the way up here and uh, into the fingerboard. You can you can actually clean between the strings on the fingerboard. And the last thing you can do is to put your cloth, kind of twist it underneath your string so that it's underneath one single string and pull it up so that it cleans everything that's underneath of your strings too. Um, underneath the strings will always get dirty because no matter how often you wash your hands, you will inevitably always have something on your hands. Um, but on that topic, try to keep your hands clean when you're going to play your cello. Uh, a lot of people will wash their hands every single time that they go to touch their instrument at all. It's a good practice, it really helps. Um, some hands are making sweat or oils that are a bit more acidic than others. And depending on your particular body sweat, then uh, you might actually destroy your, your own um, varnish uh, without really wanting to just by sweating onto it. Um, for people who have that sort of a problem, you'll often notice it because the varnish will get wipe, uh, kind of damaged or, or essentially vanish in some places uh, and leave just the naked wood. Uh, there are some ways to, to prevent that from damaging your cello further. I would go to your instrument maker and they can add um, plastic plates or I'm not sure which materials they always use, but there are certain materials that they can add here on your instrument um, or on your bow that will help reduce the amount of damage that you do with your own hand um, just by normal playing. Uh, keeping that in mind, just wash your hands before you play your cello uh, every time if you can, uh, because this will definitely reduce the amount of dirt and stuff that gets on your instrument. Um, some people talk about uh, cleaning the strings with um, water or alcohol, I would really avoid doing this. If you if you do clean your cello with a cloth regularly, you will pretty much never have to do this. Um, it is possible to use alcohol on steel strings. However, alcohol is really, really dangerous for the rest of your entire instrument. Uh, alcohol will take off pretty much every cello varnish that exists. Even just a drop of it will really damage the varnish there for permanently. Um, so do not use alcohol if you can help it. Um, there are really very few situations uh, where that's going to be necessary. With regular maintenance, regular cleaning, uh, you I've never had to use alcohol or any strong products to clean my instrument. Um, and I think a couple of times at the violin maker to repair it, they've maybe used a tiny bit of instrument cleaner for one spot or another spot uh, where the the rosin had caked on a little bit, but uh, but generally speaking, uh, that's that's not really necessary. Uh, water is also not a good way to clean your instrument. Again, water is not so good for the wood. Uh, the wood will soak up the water, it will swell up, and when it dries out, um, it will crack. Uh, if you've ever seen driftwood, uh, it always has these big cracks, and that's because it keeps getting wet. Wood will always split open if it continues made wet and dry. Um, this is kind of the reason why the temperature changes also make such a big difference. Uh, yes, and if you happen to have gut strings, I did mention earlier that you could, in extreme situations, use alcohol on steel strings, but if you have gut strings that don't use steel strings, but if you have gut strings that don't use anything, those are, those are, don't use water, don't use alcohol, they should be cleaned only with, uh, with, a, with a cloth. And, uh, and I think if they get too dirty, we'll probably just have to change them. Um, got straight, but I wouldn't use it over the whole cello. And I definitely wouldn't clean it on a regular basis with instrument polish. All right, so cleaning. Um, a lot of uh, people, when they see the cello bow, will see it and, uh, and kind of grab the whole thing. Um, however, these hairs are actual horse hairs and much like your people hairs, if you touch them with your hands that are usually a little bit dirty and certainly oily because skin always produces a little bit of natural oil, um, your hairs, uh, your bow hair, fatty and essentially slippery. Um, so try not to touch your bow hairs at all if you can. Do not grab your bow for any reason using the bow hairs. You can touch the stick anywhere you want. Um, again, wipe it down regularly, however, uh, mostly from some of my colleagues from university who, um, a lot of my uh, bachelor's colleagues were music teachers. They um, studied to become 
orchestra teachers in various uh, high schools and middle schools and, and uh, elementary schools in the US. And uh, school instruments often have to deal with really, really tight budgets. And they're dealing with children who don't always take really care to touch their instruments uh, in the right way and make sure that they're not touching their bow hairs uh, or they're not wiping down the instruments as often because it's just in that scale. And with so many kids uh, using the same instruments, it ends up being really difficult to keep up on this regular maintenance. Um, so I've, I've heard of uh, school teachers cleaning bow hairs in order to have them last one more year so that they have time to wait, save up, save up a little bit money um, from the school budget to then replace the hairs. Uh, but for your private use, um, I don't think that it will ever really be necessary to shampoo the hairs. There are special shampoos for horse hair, uh, for bow horse hair. Uh, it's a complicated process because you can't get the wooden parts of your bow wet. Um, you also have to know how to take your bow apart. So again, I would really avoid it if you absolutely must do it. There are some tutorials, I don't know where, um, but I know that they uh, they do exist because a couple of my, my orchestra teachers in high school did manage to do this. And if you're not sure, you can also ask your bow repair shop or your instrument repair shop. Uh, they will usually have some really good advice on how to deal with this. All right. Um, if you don't touch your horse hair, though, you'll probably manage to have it for uh, I tend to change my bow hair a couple of times a year, but that's because I really care about the quality that I have. Um, some people change it even more often. Uh, I don't think that more than once a year is really necessary. Um, if you're just a, an amateur, you're playing maybe not so many hours every day, uh, and you're taking good care of the humidity, the temperature, and uh, making sure you not touch your bow hairs. I've also had students who didn't change their bow hairs since they bought their cello and uh, the hairs were still there and still full enough uh, years later. Um, certainly the, uh, fresh bow hairs will grab the rosin a little bit better and um, then play a little bit more easily. Uh, so if you've not changed your bow hairs for a really long time, I do <laughs> suggest trying it out. Um, bow rehairs can, can cost a little bit of money then. Uh, here in Berlin there, uh, they're often somewhere between somewhere around 80 euros for a bow rehair, um, which funnily enough, you can also buy a brand new bow for 40 euros. It's not a very good bow though, 40 euros. It's not a very good bow though. Um, in any case, it can be a little bit pricey. So if you're not really able to afford getting your bow rehaired on a regular basis, um, just keep it as long as, as they stay clean, as long as they don't break too much. Um, you don't want to have too few hairs on your bow because it can help, it can lead to warping, warping your bow. Uh, so let's talk about the bow for a bit. Um, the bow hairs, again, horse hairs, they function a lot like your hairs. Um, you can, uh, there's this screw here on the cello bow that allows you to tighten and untighten your bow hairs. This is one of the mistakes that I often see with beginners who start using YouTube tutorials, um, always let your bow hairs relax while you're not playing. So if you relax bow hairs, you'll notice that eventually they start sort of hanging down. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but they get a little bit wobbly there. And, uh, and then you can tighten back up for while you're gonna play. Um, how tight you need to have it is a little bit of a personal uh, thing. You might wanna ask your teacher there. I don't know if we'll, we won't get into cello position kind of things today, but the most important thing for the health of your bow is that you've always still got a cur downwards curve in your bow. If the bow gets straight, or if it starts, then uh, you've actually over tightened your bow by a lot. Um, it's, it's much too tight. Uh, you can tighten your bow too much. Your bow hairs will usually be tight enough that you can make them extra super tight. This is because um, in order to allow you to use these bow hairs for a long time and because bow hairs will eventually stretch, um, the person who put the bows on your hair will have given you a lot of a lot of room to tighten your bow a lot. Um, however, this is not good for the health of the wood of the bow. Um, the stick of, of the bow is, all, is always made out of a flexible kind of wood. Um, but just like every wood, if you bend it and get it damp and then leave it there, 
uh, it will slowly reform itself. Uh, this is the very, very slow and painstaking process that instrument makers use to curve the sides of an instrument uh, into the sides that we see, these nice, beautiful uh, round curves that, that, uh, that we see are, at least on, on well-made uh, handcrafted instruments, over, they're curved into that shape over months uh, with a special device that slowly but surely um, curves the, the wood into that shape. Uh, wet wood, will, it, when it's thin, will always be very formable. Uh, but you don't want to reform your bow. Uh, you want to try to let it keep its, keep its natural form. Um, so do always remember to loosen your bow hairs when you're not playing. And if for whatever reason your bow hairs are having to be tightened so much that you overbend your bow, then consider if you can actually have them a little bit looser. Um, the other thing that happens if you over tighten your bow is that uh, your, I've mentioned this before, the, the horse hairs will stretch. Um, and once they've stretched kind of to their maximum, they'll start breaking or you won't be able to tighten your bow enough to play comfortably, in which case you'll have to replace your bow hairs. And so having your bow tightened all the time without loosening it when you're not practicing or over tightening your bow will actually lead to you having to replace your bow hairs more often than if you always rela relax the hairs when you're not playing and use a moderate amount of tension um, or a minimal amount of tension uh, for playing the bow. Um, if you forget for one night, don't worry, it won't break in one night, um, but uh, it happens to me also every so often I'll get distracted and then I'll leave and then the next day I'll, I'll notice that I, I didn't untighten my bow and, uh, and then I'm a little bit upset with myself, but it's okay. Um, none of these things will cause permanent damage if they happen once in a while, um, but if you're going to be leaving for a week, then maybe double check to make sure that your bow is loosened. I, I do often do this if I loosened. I, I do often do this if I leave the house and I won't be I won't be at home, then I'll double check. I'll open up my case and see if my bows are still loose um, because having it over tightened or normally tightened for a whole week while you're not playing it is a very long time. Um, and if you are gonna be away from home while we're on that topic, then uh, then put your cello in its bag or in its case so that it's as safe as possible and that if for, every, for any reason there's a major temperature change in your home, uh, maybe a window blows open or um, the heater or the air conditioner uh, start working in ways that they weren't supposed to, uh, then at least your instrument will have a slower temperature change. Um, there was a cold snap in the, in the US and also a few weeks of very cold weather here in Germany. Um, when you're dealing with really sub-zero freezing temperatures, there are kind of thermal cello bags that you can purchase, um, which can be a really good option uh, for uh, your cello case and to make your cello's thermal retention, basically the heat and the change of temperature even slower. Um, this is something that, uh, for example, I have a carbon case, which is very thin. It's one of these Accord cases. And uh, because it's so thin, the cold and the heat and everything, they come in out of the case quite quickly and quite easily. Um, so with sub-zero temperatures, either I avoid leaving the house at all, um, but if I have to leave the house, then um, either I try to keep my time outside short uh, or I put I would consider getting a cello bag in addition to my cello case, um, just a soft cloth bag that would uh, cover the cello completely while it's in the case. So. I see Paul has a question, how long are strings supposed to last? Uh, this is another very subjective question. However, generally speaking, your, uh, my strings, I use them for about one year at a time. Um, there are people who change their strings every three months. Those tend to be soloists and uh, professional performers who are recording a lot or dealing with, uh, you know, very high-end uh, concert situations. Uh, since I don't get paid enough to afford very nice strings every three months, I do not put nice strings on my cello every three months. So they have to last a year for me. Um, depending on which strings you get, um, steel strings will probably make it for a year. Um, for most most brands, I use, I use a mix of um, 
spiracore for the two bottom strings, for the C and G strings, and um, Yargar for the A and D strings. Uh, another popular mix is Larson for A and D strings with the spiracore. Uh, other people like to have a full full set of strings. Um, strings is a whole rabbit hole that I've not really spent a lot of time with. Um, but in any case, I would I would say that um, the time to change your strings is either when you have the money for it <clears throat> after a year or two, uh, or if you want to do it based on the way that the strings sound, uh, it will be the time when the strings start to lose their intonation. Um, so I, I recently read someone who suggested that uh, if you pluck the strings, that's often a sign that your string is sort of over the hill. It's no longer really keeping the pitch very well. If you notice that your strings are going out of tune a lot, uh, that's not usually met, and that's not always just the string problem. That's often something with your cello setup more than it is uh, the strings, or it could be a big temperature changes. But that could also, in some cases, be a string problem. You could try changing your strings. So I would say uh, somewhere between six and 12 months would be kind of a comfortable rhythm to be changing your strings. But if you don't have the budget for that, or um, for whatever reason that's not possible in your area to order strings on such a regular basis. I have had students who played on strings that were very old. And depending on what your your goals are as a cellist, the ideal sound will have really fresh strings that are changed every three to four months, lower strings maybe every six months. Um, and, uh, and that will have the absolute best quality of sound. Um, but it, that can get, again, can get quite expensive. Um, the C string that I buy from Spiracore is about 100, just alone, about 100 just alone, just the one string. So if I buy a whole set of strings, uh, the other strings are a little bit cheaper because they're thinner and uh, shorter. Well, not shorter, but they're just a little bit smaller. So um, they uh, they cost a little bit less, but I still end up spending two, at least 200 uh, euros for a set of strings every time that I buy strings. Um, so again, depending on what you're using the cello for, uh, this may be realistically affordable for you or not. Uh, if you use uh, cheaper strings, I would cons I would really suggest using middle price quality strings. Don't don't buy the cheapest thing that there is, because those really will uh, sound quite terrible. They tend to sound very metallic, very harsh. Um, so try to find something that's sort of in a middle price category if you don't really know how to choose. And um, in some cases, if you're lucky, um, your instrument maker will actually have a selection of strings that they've uh, broken in, that they've put on instruments and let let them sit there for a couple of days or a week or two, because uh, brand new strings tend to sound very shrill and very harsh anyway. When you put them on, depending on the brand of strings, this is a little bit more or less extreme. And after a couple of days or a week, the strings sort of settle. They've, uh, they've stretched themselves out to their normal playing uh, or their ideal playing length. And, uh, and that will actually make them sound ideal. So most of the time, if you were looking to have new strings for performance, then I would actually put them in a few days or up to a week before your performance, um, even, even two weeks before the performance, you'd have to kind of experiment with those exact strings. Um, they'll reach their absolute peak a few days after you put them on. So I hope that uh, that helps answer your question, Paul, with the, how long the strings are supposed to last. Um, the, uh, the super budget answer for that is they will last until they break, honestly. Uh, I, have, I, had, I did do that when I was a college student. I would actually use the strings that my parents were no longer using because they were uh, both soloists and, and orchestra musicians and kind of on a much higher professional level than I was as a, as a college student. And, uh, and so I would get their nice strings um, after they were done with them, after they had had them on for, for the three months or so. So I actually never had a particularly nice strings for years and years, and I would leave them on until they broke. And uh, that worked, but uh, it's not it's not ideal. But we are talking about a very high level of perfection of sound and perfection of intonation. And um, to be perfectly honest, for most uh, amateurs who are not looking to do recording projects or that sort of thing, uh, the difference is so small that you will probably not notice it. Uh, yes, there's absolutely a risk a string break, Paul. Um, there are a couple of reasons this could happen. Um, sometimes a string will break as soon as you take it out of the bag, basically. You put it on your cello and it just breaks. 
And that's because they're made in mach like in actual factories with machines. No one really hand checks this string or hand makes the string. Um, string makers know this actually. And so if you get a string or you purchase a string, especially those expensive ones, and you put it on your cello and it just explodes immediately, even though you did everything right and you tuned it perfectly and you were careful and you didn't go too fast and that sort of thing, um, then uh, you can usually send them an email and be like, hey, I put my new string on and it just broke immediately. And a lot of times they'll actually send you another one. Um, don't do this too often, obviously. If you're breaking your string systematically, it's probably not the string, it's probably you. But on rare occasions, this can actually just be a defect of the string, that it does happen regularly enough that it could happen to you. Um, the other reason that your strings will break is because they are tightened too much. This is the major reason why beginners will often deal with a broken string at some point um, in their early cello experiences. Um, the pegs that you use to tune your cello are really powerful tools because of the way that you can turn them. You can actually weigh more than you imagine with just a small turn, like a half turn. And so you want to make sure that you always tune your cello when you're using the pegs in really small increments. You turn, ju turn just a tiny bit and check again to make sure you've not gotten too high. Um, most strings can handle going up about one whole tone higher than, the sh than it was built for. So if you have an A string, then uh, going up to a B will probably not break it. Um, but much higher than that is risky. It might not actually survive so much pressure. Uh, because you have to imagine at that point it's really got kilograms of pressure on it already. And on places where there was a note that I played very often, the string would actually start to unravel. Um, and when the string starts, when a steel string starts to unravel, you have to imagine that it's literally a thin steel raveling, thin steel plate that's unraveling on your cello. It's very, very tiny. Um, and it does end up, steel string starts to unravel. You have to imagine that it's literally a thin thin steel raveling, thin steel plate that's unraveling on your chill. It's very, very tiny. Um, and it does end up functioning as a blade. Unraveling, signs of unraveling on your string, I would really suggest taking that string off and replacing, replacing it with a new string. And on that note, uh, since the strings can break also for unexpected